Hello, stuff. I'm uh, Leisha McGowan. I am the only archaeologist working as an editor at the Nature Group of Journals. Um, I, Zena has been described as uh, the archaeo mafia. I've been <coughs> described as a cog in the capitalist machine, which sometimes is kind of hard to dispute. Um, but I guess my role as a professional editor is. I'm not a publisher, so actually Liz probably um, addressed much better than I can a lot of the questions around commercial publishing, but I sort of have a midway view maybe um, in between uh, the author experience and sort of the person who coordinates uh, yeah, uh, the publication process. And in terms of inequalities, I'm going to cheat a bit and say in the general publishing world rather than in um, just archaeological publishing, I think gender and regional imbalances, and as I think Usama was saying earlier on, uh, that language is a huge issue here. Um, you know, people who are being made to communicate outside of possibly their native languages, um, but specifically then within archaeological publishing, um, maybe not the most pressing inequality, but something I'm quite interested in at the moment is um, equitable collaboration between archaeologists and geneticists in terms of these big ancient DNA papers and things like that we're seeing. So, thank you. Yeah. Hello, um, I'm Leah. Uh, for those that didn't see me talk, um, I'm a PhD student being supervised by Zena. Um, and my research focuses on engaging multiple publics with developer funded archaeology. Um, and uh, so my paper was about um, the focus groups I've conducted with the public and archaeologists um, to assess how publicly accessible publications and grey literature are. Um, so I think, in terms of um, inequalities in publishing, um, I think there's this. I think a lot of it is about audiences. Um, I think there's a, a tendency to not really think about why we're writing things necessarily um, and why we're putting it out into the world and who's actually reading it and who we want to read it. Um, I think there's also an element of not really questioning the expert. I think, uh, unfortunately, you know, a, a lot of the people I've worked with, with the particip participants in my focus groups, have said that they feel too stupid to read uh, reports and publications. They feel like they can't even take part in some of my focus groups because they don't really feel like they're, they're qualified enough. Um, and I think a part of that is because there's this whole not questioning the expert um, and they think that they can't speak up and they can't say this doesn't actually really make sense. Um, so yeah, so I think a, 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 for me an element of it lies uh, between the public and archaeologists and publishers um, in that we're not really thinking about where it's going and why we're doing it and who's reading it and if they want to read it and how it can be improved. Hi, um, so I'm Meredith Carroll. I'm a senior commissioning editor at Manchester University Press. Um, so for those of you who don't really know MUP very well, we are kind of a small to medium-sized university press. We specialize in humanities and social science. We primarily publish um, single, single author monographs and edited volumes, and the main market for that is university libraries. We do have a growing trade program. Um, so the areas that I publish in are archaeology, medieval studies, and uh, early modern history. And um, I would, in terms of inequalities and pressures, I would, you know, second the kind of gender and kind of the diverse voices. That is a that's a real challenge. I would say another one that we see, particularly in the you know in the sphere that we publish in, is I think there's the pressures from within the university system and the, and particularly on our authors and the choices that um, so the pressures on authors and then kind of how that affects the publishing choices that they have. So that could be like directly in terms of, it could be ref or career choices. And then definitely publishers will put pressure onto authors. And that is because of the audience that we are kind of selling our books to libraries. So we have to think about our audience and that can put pressure on an author and it can cause some of those imbalances in inequalities. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, my name's Dan Stansby and I'm a, <clears throat> a post excavation manager at Cotswold Archaeology, which is uh, one of the bigger archaeological units operating in developer funded archaeology in the UK um, and I, so I suppose when I was asked to, to prepare this I was coming at it from that kind of background and I thought the two the kind of two major issues I thought about were um, so who who controls data control over data which is often hoarded um, <coughs> secret not published kept in very inaccessible archives um, in units online wherever um, but also uh, the other thing is the way that grey literature and, and developer funded publishing is the power relationships are structured is um, very much towards the interest of the client which seem to be about 
which, which are controlled by uh, archaeologists who are acting for the clients, so consultants and, and, and others, and you know, Stock England plays a role. Um, constraining the, the format of the way you can publish and the kinds of things you can write, and so we get this um, reiteration of um, you know jargon and, and things that we find dull. But that I think is very much um, create partly created by the structure that's imposed on us um, by um, relationships of money and, and hierarchy within the industry. Thank you, Dan. Um, Andrew, do you want to give us your um, summary of where you think power inequalities lie currently in publishing and a brief intro for anyone who wasn't in the room earlier to hear you? Um, sure. Uh, first of all, I'm calling from a moving train so with <laughs> no Wi-Fi, so uh, um, I'd like to second what the gentleman just said uh, regarding inequalities for uh, money and seniority. Uh, it would seem that uh, academic publishing and archaeological publishing may be uh, bias towards more experienced uh, researchers with which have or who have access to funds uh, and seem to be biased against early career researchers uh, the unemployed unaffiliated and adjuncts um, who also need to publish their work um, so it's the access to resources but also you know the, the persons who have more privilege seem to have I think we know where that's <laughs> <laughs> Add in your own final word. Uh, hopefully we'll get Andrew back. <laughs> yeah, uh, one other thing. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm the director of public communication for the American Numismatics. I was the uh, publisher for the American School of Class Studies at Athens. Um, I do my own research as a PhD candidate at the University of New York, so I'm an author, but I'm also publishing, so I'm kind of a Tiresias so of the academic world, I guess. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so, uh, lots of clearly so many areas in which there are um, imbalances and uh, power inequalities. Um, so, a question to, to the whole panel um, Who do you think should set the publishing agenda? Um, do you think it's publishers, funders, academics, the reading public? <laughs> Meredith, yesterday and just now, has also reminded me of librarians. Um, you know, who, who should be controlling? what directions we, we head in. Any takers? My answer to that was going to be a cop out and say I think it's very much community led and that, you know, well, certainly as an editor, I expect to reflect the communities in which we practice, but it sounds like somebody else. No, I mean, what you've got is a layer of professional archaeologists, <coughs> including academics in that, who effectively are publishing for a process which is um, either for furtherance of academic career or the management of planning, and that's a total pro that's a professional level, and that's what we have. Um, we've also got a whole group of authors working for contractors and other people who op who operate in that space. Um, in my experience, because I publish a journal um, at a lower level than you guys, but basically they're incapable of writing down to a lower level. I push back at them and grumble. Uh, we rewrite stuff, and they all come back and grumble. So there, that's that's a tear, and, and you're not going to do anything about that because money requires that to happen. Whether it's academic students, funds paid to universities for money, or whether it's developers paying contract archaeological contractors to verify planning commissions, that layer is solid. It's not going to move. There's lots of things it could do to improve itself. <coughs> and it, historic England is on the end of that. And then there's a layer down at the, the lower level, which is a community level, which is quite different, and which that lot don't actually meet, mm -hmm. uh, except through um, mechanisms which have got nothing to do with print. Mm -hmm. yes. and, and, and you're not going to generate that layer. That's a, that's a completely different group of people. I mean, and, and they're not here, yeah. on the, for the most part. Um, Leah, I just wondered if you had something. Yeah, to I was just going to say, I would agree that, um, yeah, uh, public planning, planning policy is, is broken, really. Um, it's, it's completely designed in favour of the developer and client, and as a result, reports are made specifically for them. And like you say, it is two-tiered. Um, I think one of the other problems that we have is that there's not a collaborative approach to this. Like you say, because of those two tiers, communities... Uh, want to engage with archaeology at a completely different level to the way that we do. 
Um, and so I think there has to be, I mean, one of the things that came out of a conference I went to earlier uh, this year, chat, was that we need to start thinking about how communities want to actually interpret information themselves and it doesn't necessarily have to be a printed document it has it can it can be lots of different mediums and I think that um, a lot of it comes down to literally just going and asking people what, how they want to engage um, and I think that additionally we need to start incorporating non-archaeologists into the archaeological narrative so I'm talking about artists um, and you know <coughs> local historians uh, archaeological groups um, Ch uh, children's schools, things like that. I mean, they have a lot to say and they actually have a lot of knowledge about their local area um, that we ne not necessarily would think of incorporating, including like a modern archaeological aspect as well. And their own their own connection to the history and their own connection to the landscape that has existed in their period of living there rather than just, you know, a period of time gone by. So, yeah. So if I can just maybe follow up. Um, <laughs> From that point where we're sort of moving out into to kind of how our work gets out into the the world um, and I, I know Lisa kind of touched on this in a twitter comment i think maybe yesterday or the day before um how do you think publishers could work better maybe with the media to promote the work that we're doing and limit sensationalism and so part of the problem is is when we do get stuff out there it's you know this is the Pompeii of the North or you know it, are those useful forms of rhetoric are uh, you know what can we do there to maybe try and facilitate some of those relationships maybe Amara has some thoughts on this well yeah I was, the, actually the Pompeii of the North thing um, kind of reminded me of lots of headlines I've seen um, in the Illustrated London News for example that are written <coughs> and the content is written by archaeologists and I don't know enough about how, how the island works to know what, who is writing the title. Um, but there is a sense that, um, at least in the period that I'm studying, archaeologists are quite happy to make those kinds of claims, partly because they, their you know, funding model depended on it. And so you know, that was sort of part of the structure of their framework, mm -hmm. was, was kind of bigging up that idea of making connections to things that people knew already, like the Bible or <coughs> Homer or whatever, mm -hmm. Pompeii. Um, and especially when it was places that um, were, uh, you know, places in, in, a, in an imperial context that were quite sort of alien, to, to put it into a setting that people knew more about would potentially make it a bit more fruitful in terms of attracting interest and money. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so I mean, we could see those quite kind of useful hooks to at least get people yeah. in, but whether they go further than that. Uh, um, I think that's a very natural storytelling impulse that you want to relate to your audience and you want to yeah. find a point of reference. And I think that's not just about academic communication, but anything. But um, so I don't just uh, edit archaeology. I actually work with nature, ecology, and evolution. But across, say, paleontology, and actually from my experience of writing press releases, um, archaeology is one of the one fields that probably may not need those touchstones as much as other fields do, maybe in that I think there's a natural interest in archaeology and yes it's very difficult it's easy to say that and say well you know journalist in Daily Mail doesn't need to talk about Stonehenge of, of Ireland or whatever um, but my sense is that archaeologists have a natural advantage in that the stories are very exciting to the general public so maybe we don't need to fall back on those tropes but again it's who's the we in this question you know if it is journalists how do you educate better to say that, you know, let's take advantage of there are hooks other than those touchstones or like Pompeii or Stonehenge or whatever. Mm -hmm. but, and it's all, sorry, it's also building on a tradition of archaeological publishing, like those tropes that are now used by people are directly referencing things that archaeologists were producing mm. in the 1930s mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. So, and, you know, even with Schliemann and like those, that kind of like archaeological celebrity narrative, mm. and that yeah. kind of narrative of the archaeologist as an adventure and whatever, that is why archaeology is still interesting mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. the public because of the the publishing work that was done. Is it right that that Wheeler was sponsored by the Daily Mail? Am I yeah. getting that? Lots of yeah. people. I mean, the Daily Telegraph yeah. too. Yeah. yeah. And the, part of yeah. the part of the um, <clears throat> uh, the reward, I guess, for for the sponsorship was articles in the paper yeah. that were contributed by our, by archaeologists, but that was also part of um, getting the expert, like the voice of the expert, in the newspaper. That was the that was the attractive mm. factor. 
Yeah. I think um, I think I sort of plug my own organisation here actually because I think that <laughs> the the Cotswold Twitter feed is um, and Facebook presence is I think they do a really good job of you know on social media in a social media context of promoting what we do in a sort of non sensationalist um, they quite often quite humorous and self depreciating kind of way that act, but still they get a lot of a lot of social I know social media traffic is not necessarily the same as as impact and, and community engagement but but again another form of yeah. you know we talked earlier about whether kind of radio T V um, or yeah. count as different forms of publishing. So if yeah if you want a way of of, of thinking about how to do these things in a non sensational way you could do worse than look at the Cotswold archaeology website and the Twitter feed. Lizzie had a point yeah. and Doug as well. Yeah, so um, I would say that you know, for me, because well, obviously it's the articles that get published basically through publishers that um, then get taken on. Because um, we try to do to, to promote our journal articles, obviously as much as possible, um, and we will try and do that through like press releases, for example, in which obviously we work with the authors, so that would be a way to stop that sensationalisation. Um, the biggest issue we have though is. Um, like, we're not involved in the editorial process. Like, I don't see any articles. So I rely on editors mm. to tell us if there's an article coming out, um, if there's any articles that would be benefit from this. Um, and I understand that editors are really busy, um, but we need that information. Without that, we can't, we can't do that process. We can't follow up. Um, and even with things um, like kind of, you know, so Twitter, I actually think, I know you said that that isn't good for impact, but it can be good for impact, particularly in relation to reaching out beyond the, the mm. um, academy. Um, but again, it comes back to the idea of, you know, I, 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 I can do it, but I can go through and I'll find something. I'm like, oh, that sounds cool. Um, you know, but um, we kind of need that expert subject knowledge. Um, and so, so that's, for me, that is the big thing is being able to work with the editors and then to flag up the articles. Then we can work with the scholars themselves and get those press releases, get that out, and then hopefully we're flagging important research in that non-sensationalised way um, that is a benefit for kind of everyone within that. And the few times I've done it um, with some political science journals, it's worked really, really well. Um, and that was about, um, one of them was about uh, the amount of women in the uh, EU parliament. And that came out the day of the EU elections, <laughs> um, which we did time. Yeah, I did type that. Um, so, but that worked really well, and you know that is a subject that can inflame people. I want to say, um, and it, but it worked very, very well, and they got a lot of traction and a lot of engagement. So. Mm. I was just going to say, I mean, um, very much the same with academic book publishing. We rely on the author very much to kind of you know, they give us the starting point. They they help us to identify the key points, and so. I wouldn't really say it's a big concern in terms of kind of misleading the public in terms of the research, but often for our struggle, it's often to try and get the author to to think about that the broader audience because they are very much kind of focused on their academic sphere, and so we sometimes it's a, it can be really kind of pulling it out of them, trying to get those get them to think about why is this relevant to a wider audience. Mm. Um, but we, we also use Twitter quite a lot, and, and we find it really successful. And I think we we often have quite a lot of fun. So as a publisher. Manchester, we embrace a lot of the kind of background of, of Manchester as kind of, you know, so they kind of northern industrious, rebellious in some ways. Um, and so a lot of our politics books kind of are on that kind of bent. And so with a lot of the things in the, in the kind of politics at the moment, things that were coming out on Twitter, we, we capitalize on that. We kind of use that to promote our books. And we often did some kind of fun marketing things. We, we sent free books to uh, politicians who probably wouldn't agree with our views, but we oh, said, cool. you should read this. Um, <laughs> they probably threw it in the bin, but we, you know, we, we kind of used those venues to try and kind of counter things that were going on in politics and others, other ways to kind of push, push our books beyond academia to kind of say, no, look, you know, we are, people are, people are talking about the other side of the argument and tr trying to mm. get them to see, you know, just not the archeology, span but, you know, much broader in terms of academia. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I think Doug had a, a point earlier, so we'll get to Yeah, that. I think most of the publishers have brought up that it's actually the archaeologists who are flagging it up. And I think it is a problem of us, and I think we are the ones who are sensationalizing stuff. And I'm not sure if we're actually, I think we think we're sensationalizing it, but I actually would imagine most of the public 
doesn't actually understand what we say. So when we say it's the Pompeii of the North, how many people, like we all know what Pompeii is, but I'm guaranteeing you a huge chunk, you're basically aiming for people who kind of are already interested. So if it's going to the Daily Mail or the Guardian or anything like that, you're only picking out headlines that are going to go to people who are already interested in archaeology. You're not bringing anyone new. Um, I mean, it's kind of a joke, but I would probably be willing to say that half the people that went and saw the movie Titanic didn't know that ship was going to sink. <laughs> Or didn't, like, you can see on all the comments of, uh, like, that horrible movie Pompeii, the volcano exploded. Like, when we're saying, like, the Pompeii of the North, we're all, we all know what that is, but I suspect that we actually are just saying words that people are like, I mean, you could pick a topic, so I'll, I'll do like, oh, yeah, it's the Corallus of, of uh, Scotland. Does anyone know what I just said? <laughs> no, but it's local to me, exactly. I, I do wonder if, like, we complain about these top, these, um, Headlines, but we're probably but we ones we're creating them, and they probably aren't. They're not as good as we hope they are, and they're probably not as bad as we think they are. And that they're sensationalizing stuff because we probably aren't actually reaching a lot of people. Mm. Um, so sorry, um, I was just wondering as well if this le leads into something which is not archaeology specific, um, and I'm not saying anyone in this room does this. Um, but the idea of the article is done, I don't care anymore. It's done, I've done my bit, it's over. Um, and you know, research products are a lot longer now than they used to be, so to an extent that already stops that because you're probably gonna do several articles out of it. But um, for amongst a lot of people, there's still that idea that once it's published, it's over, it's done with, I don't need to do anything else again with it. Um, but maybe the answer is that actually, that's not what we should be should be doing and you know obviously <clears throat> as a publisher we're quite like no because we want to make sure it's getting out it's getting read obviously we, we want to do it from that perspective but it feels like maybe that attitude which um, I think is dissipating amongst younger scholars but is still still prevalent in, in some of the more established scholars um, that feels like that could be something that might also feed into this I think the discussion. ref impact agenda is probably pushing against that positive or negative Maybe up the um, person back, I don't know. Hi, um, I work for the journal Antiquity and we have quite a <coughs> well developed relationship with the press. And I wouldn't say um, it's the archaeologists who are sensationalising um, the stories because we, we write press releases and we, we set them up, we have a press list. But by the time the media write their own article, they're the ones coming up with the headlines. Mm. They're the ones coming up with like Pompeii of the North. Um, so I don't know what, what we can do about that. I, we obviously pick stories that we think will interest the general public. But we don't have the control. Once, once you've done that, you don't have then the control of what the journalist is going to write. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, I really don't know how I could influence like the journalist of the Guardian or the Daily Mail. I know they're notorious for it, but I, um, how I could say to them, don't. <laughs> I, think, I think that's a resourcing issue so one of the things we have the advantage of at nature is we have a huge press office and um, so actually for papers that editors and as you were saying you, you do rely on editors and authors to, to flag issues like this but if we anticipate say a controversial but so typically a lot of the archaeogenomic papers that are coming out and actually even more so um, modern day population genetics, for example, I don't know if anyone saw, there was a paper pub published yesterday in one of the nature journals linking um, a, genomic, uh, a genomic predictor for income, um, which is obviously quite uh, controversial, but that's something that comes with a press release. So if you can actually communicate directly with the journalist, not just on, it's a bit like what you're saying about the article, you don't just write the press release and then no, leave. But if you can, but I agree, no, you know, you lose a certain amount of control afterwards, but I do think that's more of where yeah, money comes into it to a certain extent if you have the resources to continue the conversation. Cool. Yeah, uh, yeah just up on that point because it's definitely, you know, it sort of ranges from the ridiculous to the, you know, highly dangerous and, and damaging, you know, the kind of extent to which things are manipulated by the journalists. And I, I've never, never quite thought about, you know, but we could explore the possibility that why we you know, it's the archaeologists and secondary journals that 
actually control that information, we produce the information in the first place. We are the primary researchers. And then we're just, we seem to be just kind of vulnerable to just having to give it away to newspapers or journalists to try and get coverage for it. But why, why are we not creating a kind of, as a group, um, set of journalists or outlets that we've actually kind of vetted and thought, well, actually, you're a really balanced and impartial journalist. You do things properly and impartially and objectively. You're a really good outlet. We've been through you know, your, your stories we see. And actually just prioritise those journalists first, or prioritise those outlets first. And just give your research to the journalists and the outlets that do it properly and then ahead of time over the other journalists. They, so you're giving it to the you know, right people and they're breaking the story first. Would that, is that not worth it? Probably not the reason why we can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> it looks like Amara really wants to respond to that. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I mean, this is Sounds something that I've, um, that I've come across is that um, in, in, you know, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, archaeologists had direct relationships with publishers and there wasn't anyone sitting between the archaeologists and the publishers. So I think it is <coughs> a matter of, um, as you were saying, developing a, a sort of network of people and making that a priority if you want to change <coughs> the way archaeology is covered. Um, it's a matter of reaching out and making those networks and then um, sustaining them yeah. and not just kind of like saying, okay, you've done one thing that's good and then we'll leave it at that. It's a matter of like developing a relationship long term and being able within that relationship to um, to exert a bit of power. So, for example, I had one, um, I was looking at the um, archives in the Garsting Museum, and John Garsting um, wrote to the, the editor of the Illustrated London News when the Illustrated London News had published one of his photographs without asking permission first. And he was really angry about it, and he said, you have damaged our relationship. And the editor then published a, an apology in the next issue. So it was a really fast exchange and it worked, and that was because he had already had a very long-standing direct relationship with the editor. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a, a nice kind of example of what that kind of relationship can do mm -hmm. in terms of getting archaeological information out there in a sort of public mm -hmm. setting. Uh, I think David had a point yeah. earlier. It's on a slightly different tangent. Um, I've heard about the importance of the visual in all of this, because you put stuff down, you want to make it look good, you want to have the, the images there, because archaeology is, you know, it, the visual element is a big, big part of it. But coming from particularly an early career uh, perspective, like one of the issues I found in terms of publishing is image rights and the cost of it is just exorbitant. I, I mean, I'm publishing an article next year and they asked me, can you get an image of this? And I was like, well, yeah, it's in London. I'll go take a picture. And they were like, well, can't you just write to the museum and ask them for the image? And I was like, no, because you're not <laughs> money for it. I was like, I'm going to take my own picture. And because you're not going to get any money out of it. So you're basically operating at a net loss of an early career person and in so many cases obviously you know contract wise i mean i can't afford to be shouting out hundreds of pounds of images but then what i don't know, I, do, I don't really know what the answer to is but that to me seems a very difficult part of it as well mm. to get the mm -hmm. image, but paying out the money for image rights is, is i know a colleague of mine who spent thousands yeah. on uh, publishing a thesis just to get the images it's, yeah. it's, you know you can't get grants to help you it's very difficult yeah panel i mean I, I would I would love to say I have the answer for <laughs> yeah. um, you know that yeah we do we do require authors to get permission and that often does require them to, to pay out I would say uh, it in just in the years that I've been working with in, in this field I think things have changed there are more and more galleries and museums that are opening up their um, their database of images and you know every year I think more and more are making them freely available but I think there still are a lot that aren't and I, I think archaeology <coughs> you know the British Museum is, is a one big, you know, big one that our authors struggle with I, I yeah I wish I had a good answer there are yeah as you say there are some funders but there's not a lot um, so all we can do is just try and find alternatives um, I, yeah, I wish yeah. Yes. the developer funded position on image rights for example if people well, wanted to use stuff I mean publications do you mean in terms of, of using our images? Yeah. Well, we, I mean, we obviously retain copyright for images we've created, but I don't, I can't think of a, of an example where someone said, can I, can I use your, 
photo. I mean, I suppose researchers. I think we would just say to researchers, yes, you can so use you can use our images. So, do you have to but, retain copyright because it's what your clients mandate, or is it is it a way to kind of control how people are using? <laughs> No, I mean we the, the, we retain our uh, our own intellectual property. So what we create mm -hmm. is our not ours, but it's mm -hmm. it's our charities. Mm -hmm. um, so you could open your license. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we, I mean, we don't really face issues of 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 having to pay to publish images because our work tends to be focused around the field work that we've done and we've created those images. So we don't have the same problems of trying to to use a photo someone else has used. Um, yeah, we. I mean, uh, in terms of difficulties of um, ownership, they tend to come in terms of archives. Because we don't, we don't own physical archives, only paper archives. But that's a bit different. Yeah, did you? Oh, I was just going to say, yeah. I mean, just following on from what you said, you know. Um, there are hundreds and hundreds of site photos, but mm. it, within grey literature reports themselves, I mean, obviously you sometimes get a link to where you can find yeah. like other resources, but they're not included. Um, mm. So what's the point? <laughs> um, we, uh, we, you, you struggle to find a Cotswold archaeology report without a photo in it, I think. Oh yeah, but I'm, ta I'm talking about, yeah. I mean, one photo is, is yeah. what's or the point of that either, you know? <laughs> yeah, but I, I'm, just, I'm just saying. But no yeah. one makes those, no. those, those no. photo archives. Yeah, no, they don't, were, that's there right. There was a photo archive of That's, an entire site. Yeah, I'm I pretty agree. sure that would be hugely beneficial, not just I to agree. researchers, but also just to the yeah. local people who that's, want to have a little look at what happened. I think that's part of the whole data issue that I was talking about. Yeah, it's the, I agree. It's the publication of the data, and um, it's just not something that's on the radar of, um, I think, senior folk in, in the developer self funded sector. But I think it will become so, probably, as, as people get older. And, so various hands popped up. So I think Doug's went up earlier, then Lucia, then a person in Burgundy, and a person with waistcoat. <laughs> Sorry that I don't know people's names. <laughs> it, it was not to, it was just to circle back and say, actually, it's not the journalists you need to be in contact with, it's the editors. Because the journalists don't make the decisions on what gets published. And they're pretty much in a worse position than anyone in that they have to pitch articles to their editor. And if they don't get enough articles picked up, well, they don't have a job anymore. So it's the editors, and editors, like the Daily Mail is not in the business of reporting fact or news. And most newspapers, a lot of newspapers aren't. They're in the business of selling advertisement. And that's what they're doing, and that's what's going to drive why they put what they put in the newspaper. Um, and if, if you really actually try and get good stuff out there, don't go for the nationals. Okay. Go for your regional newspaper. Mm -hmm. um, they will publish it, and they will publish it usually without the headline of the oldest, the biggest, the deadliest, the whatever <laughs> it is, is that it needs to be to, be, to make the headline. Because it'll be important to regional newspapers because it's there, it's regional. And people will be super interested in it. Um, it goes back to your report, your, your talk about how People were interested in the reports because it was local, mm. and that's that's where you're going to get stuff. But like trying to work with national newspapers to not make it the ist of oldest, shiniest, treasureish, whateverish, um, is going to be really hard because that's not the business they're in. Mm. Mm. So I, I wanted to, to hear people's comments on um, being editors of journals, um, or assistant editors of journals, and the gatekeeping function that those. Um, periodicals um, perform with, you know, the, to get back to some of the things that we were talking about earlier, the future of the precariat and the people who are, who are in short-term jobs, if, if any, and how to get a more interesting range of publications, because it's not just doing precariously employed people some kind of favor, you know, I mean, it's much more interesting than that. They will probably have much fresher and, and more vibrant things to say. And just look at Idol on, um, you know, as a vehicle for that. Thank goodness for that thing in, in the sort of more classical reaches of archaeology. It has really transformed things. It's been absolutely wonderful and much, much more interesting. So, just be interested in, in the journal people's comments on that. Shall I take that, or do you want to take that? Um, we can both take it. Um, uh, so I've only been uh, deputy editor at EJA for a very short amount of time, um, uh, and uh, I think one thing I would like to kind of 
um, start bringing in at the submission stage as I would like some monitoring data. So part of the problem is I don't know who these people are and so I can't make sure there's balance in a journal issue if I don't have some information about... Do you mean on authors? Or? Yeah, on, on authors who submit papers. Um, uh, now I might, you know, might be able to go and look some of that up, but so I think that could be quite a useful thing and then it would mean that we can start kind of putting together the, the kinds of data sets that we have for gender, um, we could put for a whole series of other kind of um, uh, um, protected characteristics, for example, um, which would be useful. Um, and I suppose we need to demystify what the process is for early career researchers as well. There's a, you know, there's a, so much happens in that process, you know, how, you know, how do you approach a journal? How do you, um, you know, how long should you wait till you kind of hassle that journal to get your reviews back? What do you then do when the reviews come in? Do you have to do everything that a reviewer asks you to do? You know, there's very little training in how to actually do that bit. So I think we could do some more of that. Samara and I um, have a, a, a British Academy application in at the moment. We don't know whether it will fly, but to do that sort of thing for um, young scholars in Egypt. I mean, Egypt, because they have a lot of problems with the language itself, navigating <coughs> them as a state, to demystify the system, you know, for them to tell them how to do it. You know? Mm -hmm. And and I think this will bring more more voices. You know, I mean, these are again the local. Mm -hmm. who, yes, they are scholars, but they are connected also to the local communities in Egypt. So I think this is also has to do with the visibility and another voice, another narrative to these artifacts. You know, I mean, uh, for Egypt at least to speak about the classical heritage, we have one thousand year, you know, a big chunk of Egypt. Which is not dominant when you when it comes to Jordan uh, or any other, even in Egypt itself, the classics is just something which uh, has to be marginalized mm -hmm. um, if you look at the Germans, big one. You know, I mean, Egypt told. You know, so I think this is very important first to 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 help the schoolers and also to have to give them an access and again also to tell them that maybe their article is not very technical they could go to Eidolon to have their voices here mm -hmm. uh, but again this has to do with the nature of academia as well because most of them most of the scholars has have, are publishing for a certain purpose I mean to to be promoted because the structure of the academy in Egypt uh, they are um, fully uh, they are working full time. They are academics. I mean, um, uh, it, it's it's not like the UK or Germany. They they are they have their jobs, live jobs, and which is you know, another yeah. story. But again, I mean, I mean, this this project is very important, and female voices mm. also is important because we have female archaeologists. Mm -hmm. But again, the system to navigate and go up, you know, yeah. the system is hard. Yeah. Do you want to comment on trash? Um, yes, yeah, so I guess briefly. So, in, so in two journals I'm involved with one, the theoretical and archaeology journal. So they're published by the Open Library of Humanities, which is platinum. So there's no APCs, and I guess we are so far succeeding in publishing a wider range of authors from a wider range of countries at a wider range of career stages. And I think part of that is all of our information on how to submit is very kind of open and up front on the website so everything about formatting guidelines and all of that stuff which is sometimes fairly obscure is all nah and clear and i think online submission systems like it's i find them easier because it's not emailing a mystery senior editor you just hit send and then it goes and we're double blind so no one the reviewer doesn't know who you are with britannia so britannia is 50 years old it's much more of a I guess like stalwart of kind of Romano-British archaeology um, and we do want, so speaking on behalf of Helen Eckhart, we do want a much wider range of authors but at the moment we don't really have any data as Zina said on on um, who is submitting and how um, their characteristics affect whether they're going to make it through. Um, so I think you know doing that groundwork on ethics, coming up with an ethics statement should help to at least see why things aren't getting through and then we can build on that with 
hopefully getting a wider range of more interesting papers. But yeah. yeah. Um, Lizzie. So um, also just kind of building up on that, I mean, one of the things that occurs to me as well is um, we have to move towards formatless submission. It can be formatted later. Yeah. It doesn't matter if submission <laughs> is. <laughs> who cares? As long as all the information is there. Um, it can be formatted later, and that's you know that would help a lot of people. And you know now that's that's where most publishers are moving to. So I think that was one of the yeah. first ones. Pointless and unnecessary to say. rules and hoops. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> no one reads them no anyway. <laughs> um, um, I think absolutely more data about who about who is sub who is submitting, and then who is being who is being accepted based on that. Um, and I also think you know in relation to that. Um, obviously, this is not something for authors, but I think editors also need to, to be paying close attention to their reviewers. Mm -hmm. um, not only who's doing, you know, who's doing reviewing, who's doing loads, because that's always unfair, mm -hmm. and perhaps they will get annoyed. <laughs> but also, like, who is reviewing what, and what are they saying? What what is being said? And again, we've already mentioned transparent peer review might be a way of getting people to um, think more carefully about what they might say, mm -hmm. um, particularly when it, if it is an early career researcher. Um, and then I think one of the final things that I wanted to um, make the point of is, um, you know, some journals, they, they need to take a good hard look at editorial boards and them, themselves. Um, I have a journal, which I'm not going to say, but um, when we it is a regionally focused journal. And when I suggested they publish in the language of that region, they told me that was ridiculous because then they won't get a good impact factor. <laughs> and I went out by the screen. <laughs> um, uh, so you know, I mean, and that's you know, that's pressure coming from elsewhere as well. That is not necessarily just them. That is other pressures coming in. Um, but it was, I think, a good example of you know um, how they. I mean, I'm still trying. I'm, this conversation isn't over. I've got them to agree to um, uh, other language abstracts, which is a starting point. Um, so you know, that that's not ended. But that's a you know. That is something that, you know, in this case, there are outside pressures, but I'm also kind of like, but why not? If this is going to be good for the journal, you'll get more articles, you'll get a stronger link to this region, why why not? Um, so I think, you know, it's not necessarily their fault that they're thinking that, because it makes sense that European-based editors are concerned about the measures in Europe. But no, that's your secretary. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, uh, I'm mindful that two people had hands up earlier, and we're coming so towards Adam the end of our time. Um, so maybe, uh, and I just saw someone else's hand pop up. Maybe we could take all three of those questions, and the panel could respond. Yeah. Go for it. Oh, okay. Uh, and just kind of circling back round. Uh, unfortunately, but um, about data sharing and including images. I think there's a lot we can learn from data scientists in this regard because they take control of their own data and they make it open for anybody to use via various platforms. I saw a great one on Twitter the other day where people, uh, this certain data scientist was having issues getting image rights to their own images that they publish in the journal but for, for, without paying a cost. So they put it online as a Creative Commons before they submitted their article mm -hmm. and then quoted it as a CC. So uh, if you are having to create your own images, at least keep control of your yeah. own images. Yeah. So I don't know if that's something that the journals would be particularly fond of or not, but I figure you know, if, if we are having these kind of other issues, then we might as well at least keep the data elements of our papers accessible if we can't keep the papers themselves. Mm. Thank you. Um, we've mentioned about the publishing um, being the end result in, in archives before. Um, so I'm a museum curator, okay? And from my point of view, a publication of a developer-funded archive, uh, the developer excavation or research archive isn't the end point of it. It's the deep position of the archive in a publicly accessible museum. Okay. Um, I have a genuine concern that there's an injustice built into the system that the priority is given to publication over the position of archives. Case in point, I've got over 600 sites from Yorkshire that have not been deposited. Mm -hmm. More than 70% of them exist in some sort of publication, so they've had for a list reports that exist. So the information exists in a repository where you can find it, but the material evidence doesn't. And it means that you can't, um, you know, future researchers can't then interrogate the primary archive and the, the material archive associated with that because priority has been given to publication for the long term. It's anecdotal, but at least three different um, units have told me that they can't afford the position fees because mm. they spend it all on publication. Mm. 
Right. Well, they've got to, they have to I'm, I'm going to take the last point and then we can have a response. Yeah, sorry, something completely different again for maximum diversity. But uh, I was just, it was interesting that Lisa mentioned the fact that for her journal they chose the double blind peer review system. I'd be really interested to hear about how, I mean, I think that's a really positive way of taking some of the bias that you get in, in reviews out of the system. I'd be interested to hear how the, you know, the wider general community is, is moving, uh, whether they're considering moving towards that. But what struck me was it, it seems to found, uh, rub against this talk of collecting more metrics of authors for editors. Uh, and that seems to me that the editors want to know more information about the individuals whilst we want the, maybe want the peer reviewers to know less and I just wondered maybe the whole per process should become person blind and things are just reviewed and d decisions are made on the quality of the work rather than any characteristics by the individuals. It's very rarely it's made on the quality of the work. Triple, <laughs> triple blind. Triple blind. Yeah. But and maybe that data is then revealed at a later yeah. stage. Yes, yeah, 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 that's fine. Um, Panel, uh, any any of those three <laughs> <Yes>. points. <laughs> um, I was going to pick up on your comments about the editorial board and just it's not just that diversity in the author, it's in every single part of the process. So, you know, we have we have series editors and that we try and you know, make sure they're diverse. We have our editorial committee, which um, are part of the committee who basically are part of the approval process of what con what books get contracts. We, um, um, you know, for the, all the reviewers as well. So during our commission meetings, we are all there kind of challenging all the other editors. So if we get, you know, if someone presents a project and we, you know, they say who the peer reviewers were, and if they were two white men from the Midlands on a project, you know, like, so basically, well, why didn't you get someone from, you know, different countries, different genders, different, you know, so why, you know, so we, we, we interrogate each other and we make sure that, you know, so during those meetings and so there have definitely been times where um, maybe the, we didn't feel like the peer reviewers were diverse enough or sometimes we get um, quite often the edited volumes we still get edited volumes where every single contributor on the edited volume is um, is a man so you know and basically we were kind of like we just do not believe that there are no female <coughs> researchers in that area so we basically we reject that project this commission editor has to go back go to that volume editor and say Trying, trying to get a more diverse list. So it, it, so we kind of, we don't keep, we don't keep data specifically, but we kind of are aware and we challenge each other and exactly <laughs> as and when it comes up. Um, so I'm very aware that archaeology not necessarily is a problem for me, but um, early modern history, my list is very, very male, and it's something that I'm very active in terms of. Um, a lot of the projects that I get are, you know, people come to me and they want to publish their books with me. I'm not going to turn them away because they're a man, but I will, when I have um, the other books that we publish, I basically, I go out and, and talk to people and encourage them to submit. And so I concentrate my my efforts on trying to balance out the, the rest of my author base. So it's, it's very much, you know, you have to tackle every single part of the whole kind of publishing landscape of, you know, I'm glad to do I just to do add to that and say that I think one of I think that's what all good editors should aim yeah. to be doing. Yeah. But I think there is an issue with visibility and diversity in that um it's a lot harder for editors for editorial boards to find you if you're not visible and that is definitely a case for I know women, for people from minorities, for people in the global south. So um if I could give a plug to anyone uh to make sure you are searchable. Um there are also things, I actually don't know if this exists for archaeology, but covering sort of ecology and evolutionary biology fields, there are a lot of self-nominating databases where people yeah. can say, I nom self-nominate as diverse for whatever reason, yeah. here are my keywords for my research. Yeah. That is the biggest gift to an editor. Yeah, we use that. So I, that there's so one for good. history, I think. It's like, okay. women do history. And yeah, we, so we use that database to... Is yeah, there an archaeology one? Yeah, so there's a woman of ancient history which Sarah Bond created, which is like ancient history archaeology. Okay. But I don't think there's a online... Order, yeah, archaeology one, but maybe someone should. Someone should. Mm -hmm. get. I mean, we've talked about reading okay. lists, and I'm wondering whether yeah, maybe you should a different self nominated one mm -hmm. might be a better way for Because at the moment, <laughs> I think there has to be every editorial board in the country is going to have some kind of diversity target, mm -hmm. and all they want to do is fulfill that. And if they can do that by, it's such an easy win for them if they can do it by doing it, you know, a searchable database or something. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's a no brainer, I think. So. Thank you. On um on archive deposition, um, 
the, the, the county curator should shouldn't be shouldn't be advising the sign off of the planning permission, surely. If the archive hasn't been deposited. So um, but you haven't got it. In many cases just with the submission of a report it picks up the uh, whatever the requirement was in the mitigation strategy. Things from our point of view as a museum, yeah. you have no stick to beat anybody with no. because you have no power to So is that because mm, is that because you yeah. often don't have a curator in place that's being signed off by the planning officer? Uh, well, oh. the curator will point to do with this. I think you mean a outcome. county curator, don't you, rather than a museum? Right. Sorry, yeah, I mean a county oh, yeah. council they archaeological advisor. Exactly. Yeah. They definitely um, exist and happens, but have been written 30 years ago. Yeah. It's very variable what reason, isn't it? But I mean it shouldn't happen that they get signed off <coughs> like that. Leah, any yeah. final contributions? I was just gonna say, um, that's another huge problem what you've just identified is that, you know, sticking it online doesn't really mean anything. But also, how do we know it's even going to the right people in the right place, you know? It's um it's clearly not. So yeah. <laughs> One very quick final it's, thing. And then no, I'll this is this is a really cheeky little thing because I would just like to know what journals are these that are charging you to reuse your work? Because I haven't, at least in the social sciences, why you just not do that? Um, and I'm just wondering what what journals are doing this? That's insane. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can have a little yeah, chat. Right, that, yeah. that might be kind of cheeky because obviously I'm just like. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and just going back to the deposition thing, I'm obviously I'm work this is a different scale, but nature mandates um, archival deposition for anything it publishes. There's no reason that other journals shouldn't do the same thing. To I mean, because it's about data reuse, reproducibility. We ma well, we're not mandating, but very very strongly encouraging, which happily is having the same effect that data are accessibly archived. But also, when it comes to paleontology published at Nature, it covers museum specimens. So I don't see why that's not implementable at other journals because yeah. I think mm -hmm. it's really important. Yeah. I think it's partly because like, a lot of editors are scared that they'll lose authors if they make it mandatory. Yes. The ones I've spoken to now that I couldn't do So that, this is so it. our yeah. soft approach has worked. So I mean I hate I'm not boasting about it because I would rather it were a mandate. However, um, strong, encouraging, serious questioning of authors who say well if you say data is available on your request or museum specimens are only available, well, obviously there have to be processes to go through, but uh, interrogation of that often yields the result because it's a lot easier sometimes to, well, certainly data is easier <coughs> to deposit than it is to fight against mm -hmm. someone who's really questioning why you're not doing it.